All right. Well, um, this talk was going to be a little bit more technical, but I kind of changed my mind a little bit from sort of the general feel that Yanni started with and some of the other speakers that I've witnessed have talked about in that it seems the Agile community in Greece, at least, is trying to maybe do it for real and not just pretend to do Agile. So that's really what I want to talk about is what does Agile mean, at least from my perspective. So I'll talk a little bit about what I think Agile is. And I'll talk a little bit about how I arrived there. It's a little interesting. And I gave this talk to my, um, we have a developer, edu you know, developer session every Friday to mess around, do coding katas, just talk about stuff. And I gave a, a talk to my own folks. And there was part of it that I thought I was going to just trash, which was about my experience and things that I've done that have shaped my thinking into the things I'm about to, to talk about. And they said, no, that was actually pretty cool. Even, even youngsters who don't even know the things that I talked about, like they probably don't know Fortran. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about my frame of reference. I think it helps since Agile is more about how you think than what you do. I'll tell you how I think, which is kind of scary. That's why I don't meditate. I'm not brave enough for that. A lot of dark things inside. And I'll give you a little hint about my engineering perspective, also known as a holistic view. So how many here deliver features to end users? All right. How many here pay for features? OK. Some bits, that means, you know, yeah, you actually probably care more. Because um, it is important that you have a say in the room. I always tell this to folks I work with when they actually have a pretty valid point about, so the thing that I keep seeing on the status reports, or the, why do I keep seeing this? Why is it just still there? Well, and then we give all kinds of technical reasons, other excuses. But the, I always remind him that he has a right, because he's paying for it, to question it. So I'm glad to see there are people here with money. Otherwise, we just have fun writing code. So I never heard of Scrum until the Agile Manifesto meeting. So I don't know, I don't know what that means. I never heard of DSDM until the Agile Manifesto meeting. So to me, Scrum is cool, especially because one of the guys was like a bomber pilot. That's really cool. I'm an aerospace engineer, so I always like talking stories about bombers. But Scrum is just a project management technique. That's how I compartmentalize it. When we all gave our little talk about how we do development, I kind of did a blend of FDD and XP, which means feature-driven development and extreme programming for those youngsters in the room. Um, so I pigeonholed Scrum as, oh, it's just like a meta process. OK, big whoop. It's had nothing to, intrinsic to do with software, in case you didn't know that. The other thing that I ran into personally was Waterfall. And I saw its horror shows of Waterfall. But it actually can be pretty agile. And shockingly enough, I, I don't know why I used to review books or proofread books like for Martin Fowler and, and some guy named Walker Royce, who was the son of some guy named Royce Senior, who wrote the waterfall. So that was a, I'm an aero engineer. I never, I took, okay, so any of you ever be in multi, like a discipline like in aerospace, the electrical engineering courses were taught by probably the joke of the professor, the electric, like if you're an electrical engineer, you didn't get the professors we got. If you were going into computer science, you didn't get the professors the aero people got, right? So I took a computer course, I think, maybe two, probably a joke. Um, but I finally read the, who here has read the actual IEEE waterfall? <laughs> what? <laughs> 
testing. Okay, that's the Italian half of me, even though my last name's German. Um, where was I? So the first, so there was one person I think that read the actual waterfall IEEE paper, and when I read it, lo and behold, it had feedback loops and eddy, like eddy currents. How how electrical? Um, it had feedback loops. Of course, in practice, it didn't. So a lot of things in practice don't reflect reality. Maybe agile is one. So I jokingly say waterfall can be agile because when I do features in the ideal state, it's a little bit of requirements, a little bit of design, a little bit of implementation testing. Mix it all up and keep going, right? That's waterfall. Just don't do it nine months of design, nine months of, I mean, nine months of requirements, 10 months of design, then implement, and then, you know, then test, and then realize you built the wrong thing. So for me, Agile is much more holistic. And that's like a weird Zen thing. And you can tell I'm a, I'm a yoga body here. I do yoga, but I don't meditate. But I do take pictures of lotus flowers. <laughs> the idea is that what, what we do on any given part, from the business idea and hypothesis to actually coding, deploying, et cetera, it's all part of a system. You can think of things individually. You can be just, I'm the UX guy. All right, cool. But that doesn't help the rest of us. And if I had to reduce Agile to one sentence, has anyone ever tried to explain to their mom what you do for a living? <laughs> All right, mine's about to turn 88. And uh, yes, yeah, so mom, when, um, like I, when I said I tested cruise missile engines, OK, that's cool. Uh, you can kind of conceive what that means. Yeah, you run them up, they explode. They, they make jet, you know, they make thrust, um, thrust, um, but software. Well, yeah, so when you come into, because she doesn't use online bank, banking, so I can't even say that. But the idea, mom, is when you come in one day and use a web application and save some information about yourself, tomorrow it'll still be there. It's kind of what we do. Or Microsoft Word document. But in a sentence. Agile is all about reducing the time between doing something and getting feedback. No matter what that thing is, whether it's a hypothesis that Beat has about, hey, I bet they'll like to have XYZ feature in the app. Maybe. And you can do all kinds of things to test a hypothesis as cheaply as possible. But in my mind, from why do we write unit tests to why do we write acceptance tests to why do we involve the customer to why do we actually have places on the app where they can give us feedback, God forbid. That's the worst. Actually, I had talked to customers. But the idea is the shorter you make that cycle, the more agile you are. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? No. But how did I arrive at this? Through my career, I've had a bunch of really crucial mentors some of which I see about every year to this day from back in the early 80s, that when I worked with some great engineers, one of the most important things was I discovered this thing called software. And I took a manual. We used to have to do specification testing. So all right, specifications testing. This was legit because they randomly selected a production engine off the assembly line for the cruise missile. And we cold soaked it to negative 65 degrees for a couple days till the exhaust gas temperature gauge read 60 negative. It's probably negative 65 centigrade too, so it's cold, real, real cold. Um, because that's what the temperature is up at 30, 40,000 feet. And then it had to start. It's one first step, it has to start when they drop it out of a B 52 and it launches. Then it has to run at a certain Miles per gallon, I'll use a simple term. Well, I wonder if it were, in other words, that was true quality acceptance testing, meeting a spec or not. And believe me, if I even remotely f was about to fail the engine, the manufacturer is up our butt 
in no time. And you, and you had a little tiny you know, worker had to defend such things to a big, powerful engine manufacturer. So I took it out of French curve number 48, which is a really good curve for typical responses, just so you know. Anyone here even know what a French curve is? Probably not. But it's a little plastic ruler that follows a curve, and you use it to draw lines if you're an architect or an engineer. Well, I turned that into uh, from a four-hour job to a three-minute job because I discovered something called computer programs where you could enter data and you could plot it and it would come out on a silver plotter. And I remember taking it to the first engineer that worked with me and he looked at it. I don't know, John. We've never done it like that before. <laughs> My head wanted to explode because I had an R squared value. It you know, no longer mattered about the pencil. Like literally, you could fail somebody because you do the pencil wrong. <laughs> Took it to the next guy, Mr. Rich Thaler. The first one is Paul Varobi, I still see him. And Rich Thaler was the other guy, and he goes, oh, wow, that's pretty nice. So it only takes you like four minutes to do it, huh? And, it's, and it comes out on a nice printed plot. So that was a great lesson as a young engineer that many times, if you ask for permission, you might not get it. And the typical large organization, another good, uh, I can tell stories all day long. I met the inventor of the jet engine, Hans von Ohain. And I thought, I asked him, first off I asked how old was he, then I got depressed. <laughs> he was like, oh my God, he's like 24 or something ridiculous. And he invented the jet engine. But, um, but I said, oh, the only thing I knew was I was a big, Okay, I'm an aerospace guy. I love fighter planes. A big World War II guy. ME262. Any Blue Oyster Cult fans? <laughs> well, I have an ME262 on one of their covers. Uh, look, look it up. But the engine manufacturer, I said, oh, you know, Dr. Ohain, did you work for Junkers Yuma? It goes, oh, no, no, no. I never would have been able to invent the engine under that big company because that was too radical. I worked for Crazy Heinkel who wanted to just fly faster. Hmm, there's a customer with the demand and no constraints, right? No big organization constraints that are afraid to try something new. So those are great lessons that came to a very young engineer and have polluted my way of thinking ever since. So I, I call myself a software engineer. I don't know if that's true because people from Canada will say, hey, that's an actual profession. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nailed, <laughs> poser. But, um, but I am an engineer. Well, I have a degree. I don't know what I am. But. And now, my big claim to fame is there's no place that I've ever gone that I couldn't figure out how to make a coffee. So and this is how nuts I am about coffee. See, I even made an infographic for our office for people to know how to use this machine. I, I, had, to, I had to first convince them with data that this kind of coffee machine is really awesome because I collected data from mine at home and it was like, you know, 25 cents a cup. Although after I made the first cup, I gave it to, to one of the founders and I said, here's your $1,500 cup of coffee, enjoy it. But now we're up to, see I plot, this, this is the kind of chart that I put in uh, Slack. So every, every couple months I make sure people understand how much coffee we drink. That's agile. So I've been an engineer working on strange things like cruise missile engines, fighter plane simulations. I've worked, I started my own software development company and we worked for shockingly engineering type projects. And shockingly, we never did the same thing twice. So you can't make a lot of profit that way, but it's fun. Engineers love solving problems, so it was fun. And then um, Peter Code, one of my mentors, we had an opportunity to form a company called TogetherSoft and um, took that, took 10 years and smushed it into three and, and grew a company to 400 some and luckily sold it. So I've been on all kinds of projects, on all kinds of domains, probably hundreds of different domains. A lot of people think they're unique, but if you're able to abstract, they're not. And then I've worked in the last dozen years on building applications for real end users and trying to make money. I've gone through all kinds of technology. Fortran was, of course, what engineers learn. 
C was awesome. Can't shoot yourself in the foot any better than with C, maybe assembly, because I've blown up two machines with C and assembly. Um, Java was, you know, C++ was, I fell into that because Turbo C++ came out. Again, no one knows what that means, but Borland had tools like Turbo C, that's what I had. Then, oh, look, there's an upgrade, Turbo C++. Oh, it's got two pluses. Must be better. <laughs> I think I'll buy it. And, and frankly, that that's got me started on the big OO craze. And then, awesomely, I've stumbled on SQL without knowing it, something called RBase, which was way better than DBase back then. RBase was freaking awesome. Oracle and DB2 didn't hold a candle to it. I was like walking back in time when I had to do some work for IBM. And then my, my latest love is Mongo. Ruby, Mongo, Rails, Git. They're like, where were you when I was younger? Um, so the tools that are available today are ridiculous. Anybody, my grandmother, well, no, she's not here. My mom maybe could deploy something to Heroku if I had to ask her. It's just re silly what's available. So there's no excuse to be in the dark ages. And if you are, keep fighting for modern tools. Architecture, engineering block diagrams, right? fuel control systems. I, I learned interfaces were real. Like, how does the inlet attach to the engine? Oh, through an interface. How do we get the engine fuel control? How do we get the airspeed? Right? There are legitimate voltage signals that were true APIs, so to speak. So I learned a lot about that. Then these weird things that I had to learn about called data flow diagrams, because I had to work in the aero group, had to work with the software group, speaking of Conway and organization and goofy things like that. Data flow diagrams never made sense. C didn't really make sense either, especially you know, you're, you're, you're passing stuff all over the place or those global crap. I had one really wonderful person try to show us a Fortran. He wrote Java like he wrote Fortran. He just learned Java. And he reused variables for different purposes later in the one main program. It was awesome. <laughs> like, there's job security. Yeah. What are you doing now? Fixing a bug. No way. And then uh, the object modeling craze started. So I looked for different things that resonated, like booch clouds. Nah, too hard to draw because they're just too big. Literally. OMT, eh, a little too scientific. And I latched on to Peter Code's Code Jordan series of books on object oriented analysis and design. So I'm steeped deeply in OO. And I care almost exclusively about the problem domain to the detriment of people who like shiny new objects, which I love. But all the latest UI, all the latest database stuff, everything else in my mind is secondary to the business. So all those kinds of things you know, were, I actually thought EML would kind of be around more. How many people here draw UML diagrams? You still or no? Not right now. How about right now? Yeah, still. Recent, like even sketching on a whiteboard. I mean, I just did it the other day before I left. Yeah, th Monday I, I did it. OK, well, yeah, see, I'm not sure why. But I use it as a, as a mechanism for, I mean, the reason I brought the folks in there was to talk about when I was reviewing their pull request and something didn't quite mesh with the business, I redrew the business on the board to get that to sink in. Because it takes a lot of effort out of the equation if I can, I don't know, I think visually, so maybe it's just me. But it takes a lot of effort out of having to write requirements. I don't have to write a lot of crap. It's do this and here's a model and put the two together and do your magic. Anyway, that was long, you know, long ago, passed over. And then project management. I was a king of Gantt charts, Harvard project manager before MS Project. And what was funny, people in my company, this was back to Defense Department days, they would come to me and ask me, hey, you can, can you make me a milestone chart? You make cool charts. So I would start to actually put it in like a, a real tool. Well, lo and behold, that's actually a mathematical thing, you know, like, it's not just a pretty picture. And then I learned to distinguish when people ask me, okay, do you just want a cartoon or do you actually want real? And usually it was cartoon, so then I used a different tool. But anyway, so I was really good at that. And when I had my own software development company, I started trying to do software projects with Gantt charts. <clears throat> like, just make my head explode. What an idiot. I mean, I was a complete, foolhardy exercise. 
because, I mean, it's cool if you can use project management stuff for everything other than building features and like building, you know, like maybe you have to coordinate multiple teams, server deployments, server installations, people getting training. You know, I, I'll, I'll give, I love a good project manager. They're worth their weight in gold. I don't need one to manage the 10 things I got to build for features because that's just stupid to put them in a Gantt chart. Who's assigned? What's the resource? What's the lead lag? You know, is there any dependencies? Yeah, no. Just freaking build a code, all right? So then I got into the Agile stuff. And Scrum. Like I said, I first learned about Scrum. It's Snowbird. How about that? And the reason I got into it was this is the kind of stuff I had to deal with. So the software design, anyone here ever use rational, um, like RUP, Rational Unified Process? That was so awesome because when I got stupid requests with goofy acronyms, I could go to my RUP CD and I could look them up and I could get dumb definitions about things that I'm glad I'm not working on. Because, it, yeah, it's just crazy. I mean, it's basically decomposing what they thought was the right sort of approach to deliver something. Okay, uh, I mean, that's cool. It's just it typically doesn't work for, for a lot of what we do. It might work for some things. So I'm not, you know, use it if you must. But that's really what, what made me, you know, want to just throw myself off a bridge, um, jump off that little cliff into the glacier. Anyway, 20 years into my illustrious career, I went to Snowbird, and it was because of Peter Code. They didn't invite me, they actually invited Peter. He's more famous. <laughs> but I went anyway. Yeah. That's right, I was the wingman. So I went to Snowbird, and we were thinking about Ang Anguilla, which is a nice Caribbean island, the only island I've ever been to for our honeymoon, once and done. I mean, the island, not the, not the honeymoon. <laughs> but we decided to go to Snowbird because it was a little easier. And Martin Fowler can't ski, just saying. <laughs> and this is what we came up with. So you can imagine with my varied past of DOD, big, big design up front, having to do, oh, all kinds of funny interactions with our government sponsors. So, Peter Code drove into me frequent, tangible working results. Hence, working software. The, whole, the old individuals and interactions over, now I'm a pro, I was a process creator and process salesman. I love, I mean, tool creator and tool salesman. I love tools, I love process. But only in the hands of an appropriately, I don't want to say, uh, you know, someone capable of using it. Not everyone should have some of these tools. So individuals and interactions are much more important. The customer collaboration, when we used to have to go do change requests, go in front of the change request review board to build some new feature for the F-14 simulator that was running on a centrifuge. Like, oh, make, you know, again, make my head explode. And responding to change. There was one funny thing in a, uh, my company was selected to build IBM's next generation manufacturing software, shockingly enough. Actually, my company was a subcontractor to the real company who held the contract because we were five people. They could, you know, go ahead, sue us. <laughs> you got nothing. <laughs> Here, you know, I'll give you a microphone. Um, so the other company was big enough, but they wrote us into the contract. Well, they weren't interested in bullet point. Well, it didn't exist yet. This was, this was 90 five to 98, there was a thing on the contract that said, put in referential integrity. Anybody here know what, what RI is? <laughs> oh man, <laughs> it's a riveting talk. <laughs> well anyway, it's a database thing that if you're using an OO concept and database just a storage mechanism, even if it was SQL, I didn't need to build in, it's a dependency thing that you can't you know, master detail relationships. So they actually had that in the contract, forced us to do it, even though I told them it makes no difference. Luckily, I took heuristics in the day because we couldn't respond. You know, we had to follow a plan. At least I could show them that the only code change that happened during that month was database, stupid entries. And actually, no features were built. Nothing happened. And the system got a little slower because now it had to do stupid referential integrity at the database level. So you can imagine why a bunch of these bullets appeared on this board because I'm kind of vocal. 
and I think re resonated with a lot of the other folks because they've seen it too. So, any engineers in the room? Any engineers' wives in the room? <laughs> wives that are, yeah. yeah. I mean, engineers are odd people, I think. Aren't they? Are they? Kind of? You always try to figure out how things work. I don't know. Never, never short of ideas, never short of improvements. Um, but a lot of it has to do with systems thinking, the interdependencies, how stuff works together. I like to say we're often trying to find the, I don't know if this translates, but the sweet spot. So if you have multi, multiple dimensions that you can affect with different design decisions, you're trying to balance them. And that's true whether it, the most weird one sweet spot that I ever created was a cow, a device that squeezes a cow's tail. Did that translate? <laughs> it doesn't work in English either. Um, a cow tail squeezer. So that's interesting because it's extreme and harsh conditions as you can imagine. And it's battery powered and it had to last and it had to squeeze enough and it had to come on at the right times during the day to stimulate digestion. Make them fatter sooner so they could be butchered. So that was the most unusual, now that was pure engineering, not really software. But that's what engineers do. They try to balance what kind of power do I need? How much solenoid, you know, what kind of force do I need? And so we do this all day long as engineers is think things through from a large perspective. So when I'm doing software, I, you know, in the beginning, I like to know what it is we're about to build and get a just enough requirements in whatever fashion. Sometimes it's a bulleted list. Sometimes I'm sketching UML diagrams and writing things down that way, plus some lists of features. All, you know, sometimes I'm doing post-it notes as UML, post-it notes as, as features. It doesn't really matter how. But enough that I have a general sense of what it is we're about to build and I like to think of it as I'm looking for risks. And I'm looking to level the playing field in terms of uh, how, how accurate do we need to be for the next phase. Because in the government, they'd want a proposal that was plus or minus 5%. And I'd be like, OK, we'll be like about 95% done with development, then I can give you that. Like, anyway. It's really hard to be plus or minus 5% on something that might be a year long. That's just a dumb request, so we make it up. Now, if you were here in the morning and listened to the beat product vision about saving the uh, urban mobility, let me see if I get this right, to save urban mobility. Is that close? Yeah. yeah. You know, like, I looked at that mountain in 1977 for the first time. Uh, and long ago, I set a vision to climb it. Um, and it's that kind of thing I do with products. Like you're building something. I try to make a mantra of what it is, plant that vision. And the reason being, that helps those little seemingly unwritten decisions done day in and day out by everybody, not just the development. I always ask the developers to think a level above what it is you're building. Don't just be an order taker. If you're an order taker, all right, it's a nine to five job, whatever. Then, you know, but if you actually want to excel at the craft, it's important you know what you're building it for and you know the level above, you know the product vision. I'm sure you, there are things that people can use your vision to be able to bounce things off of and say, is that, are we heading towards the goal or away from it or sideways? So that's another critical part to this holistic view. The domain model, I'm a nut about, and even if it's thrown away, I mean, in the old days with Together, you made a domain model that was the code. Woo! Freaking awesome. It's shocking, because you could actually use it and turn it into ERDs, too, and build schemas. And then I would do just enough architecture. You know, sometimes it's run of the mill. Oh, it's another web app, or it's just a a new feature hanging on our existing architecture. Okay, I might not have to do much. Or other times it's, wow, you know, we have to be able to look up the user's credit rating. Oh, how many users do you have? Oh, about 300 million. 
Do you have unique IDs? No. <laughs> OK, well, how do you look them up? Well, we kind of use an inference engine. I'm talking about a credit reporting agency because they're really fascinating because I consulted with one. And, and they were bringing in com companies like Oracle and IBM because they wanted to redesign their database. I'm like, wait, so you have a homegrown database? Yeah. But the guy's like, I forget if he was dead. Um, I mean, it sounds horrible to say, but literally that's how old the system was. Or if they just had like a chunk of program code that they only had the, the you know, executable part, not the actual source code. It was some funny, like they've been walking out on this thin ice or a limb for a while. And they're like, oh, maybe we should, I don't know, get a new database system. And my gut reaction was, wow. So you're going to two big companies called IBM and Oracle who make general purpose, I, I think anyway, aren't they general purpose databases versus you, you built this freaking awesome system that could scan 300 million people with fuzzy data and return a credit report in like milliseconds. And I'm, I'm, I don't know whatever happened to that, I should ask. But stuff like that, I care deeply about. If you're telling me you gotta do that, ooh, okay. I might care a lot about architecture and test early and test often, prove that I can get something done that's super harsh like that. But a simple web app, I'm just gonna bang it out in Rails or something. Don't care. Um, and I always strive for getting something deployed as soon as possible from the get-go of a project. And that's been going on since the mid-90s, I've been able to always deploy. Me, I'm talking about me, like make it simple enough that, that even I can do it. Now, of course, I also caution people, as we get to a certain point in production, don't let me in on production. That's a bad idea. Because something happens, uh, I'll often react, and maybe not with all the proper sysadmin oversight, shall I say. So here's something that I use when I give like a multi-day long course, in-service, whatever you want to call it, on what, I actually, what we actually do in the process. So this shows all the little things that we do and tries to tie them together and tries to show a couple iterations. But the idea is in the beginning as we have the product idea and we're building models and we're, we're building feature lists and we have enough that we can get, you know, start coding and start putting things out there and iterate, iterate, and it's, et cetera. And in, along the way, we're doing all the kinds of technical things like behavior-driven development, test-driven development, and other things to also ensure that we've got safety nets in place and that we can move fast with confidence. I'm always bummed that we're only in the like 80% range for code coverage. I envy people that are, I think I envy people that are 100%. I don't know, maybe the last 2% cost twice as much as the first 98. So I'm always careful not to like, eh, yeah, that's too hard to test, don't bother. We'll figure out some other way. So I'm always pragmatic, because you don't want to be dogmatic. That would be just doing something for the sake of it's in a bulleted list. So the reason this works is because, to me, you're forming the essence of the problem when you understand your domain, you understand your architecture. And by architecture, I mean even sometimes that IBM project, there was an architecture created for essentially how to get data up from the database up to the UI and at a single level. And the idea is to be as consistent as all get out. Like I don't want cleverness, like one team is doing one part of the app, they come up with a different way to dredge data up out of the database and shove it on the UI than another team. Like, no, pick one. The consistency is a real strength. Even if you're consistently mediocre, that's way better than randomly good and randomly mediocre and randomly lousy. Like, make it the same because I'm really good at grep and I can even grep an entire code base and change lines of code with, with really good regex. So if you're consistent, at least you can do that. And I've done it. And the idea is that we're trying to balance the risk so that we don't have extremes of conditions. Don't, like if you did all the database design up front, that would be dumb. If you did all the UI mockups up front, that would be silly. You know, you, you have to be a balance of everything that you're trying to 
deliver. And the technical debt, I use, uh, I use uh, um, as, a, as a weapon sometimes. The biggest one was, uh, I think I got a six-figure deal from Charles Schwab because I was able to hack something on the airplane flying back from a meeting and show it to him. And, and then when I sent it to the, uh, the dev team in Russia, they about had a, a conniption because they knew it was a hack. And, and they said, but you always say X, Y, Z. They threw my own words against me. But I immediately put on the dev stack, fix it. But at least I could get this hack out the door, get in the early stages, six figures is a pretty good sum to get in the door from a company and make money and then not let the technical debt sit there more than one release cycle. So that's purposeful use of technical debt. And then you just have to keep applying this. So the recursion is, is really powerful. And as I've, I've already talked a little bit about turning the requirements discussions, this works whether it's a feature or a brand new product. This is a trick question, but what's the most important thing to developing software? Humans. Damn. <laughs> That's the first time ever someone got it right. <laughs> Duh. Don't, don't do that Case of wine. Yeah, you won't be able to get out the door, but it's all right. But that's, no, I mean, a lot of people say requirements, money, you need, yeah. No, it's, it, it's, <laughs> kind of, it's kind of unfortunately people. You know, and I'm just, I'll go through this fast in the interest of time. But people process and tools, all right, really good people, you don't need to tell them to use Scrum, right? You don't need to tell them to use anything. Really smart people will figure it out. Really smart people doing the same thing over and over again might come up with a process. Really smart people doing things over and over again that go, hey, I bet I can write a script to do that, might create tools. I don't know, just saying. Because I'm lazy. I hate, like the third time I'm doing the same thing, I'm like, oh, you're an idiot. Come on, automate it. And, uh, you know, so be lazy, be impatient. <laughs> really good people will save the day. And the other thing is one of the hardest things about Agile, so Ron Jeffries and I often, he'll say it's, e it's easy. Agile's easy. I'm saying, Agile's the hardest. What do you mean it's easy? Well, it's easy. You just do a handful of things and you're Agile. I'm like, no, it's the hardest because you always have to keep doing things. You always have to be thinking. That's what's hard about Agile is you can't sleep. You can't rest on your laurels. In the old days, if you were following some process, you could say, hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing uh, process 67A. Oh, well, who gets that? Well, the people doing 68. Did you ever ask them if they need it? No, I'm just doing this. Okay. So I think Agile is the most challenging because it's always different. If you're doing the same thing over and over again, you're probably not doing it right. Other tips, I like to, I always, so even the business people now use this term. Yeah, it's like John says, sneak up, to sneak up, like be quiet, sneak up. It's a, probably a, a, an idiom. But it means to walk quietly and, and get, like, get somewhere without making it too obvious. So sneak up on the answer. You don't always have to build everything. You might have an idea, and maybe you can test that idea with half of everything. You don't have to make everything happen, because what if the idea was bad? <laughs> then, you, then you only have to waste half the money instead of all the money. So sneaking up on the answer is really kind of a corollary to be la lazy. And that I made a, I think I've talked about it earlier, but a stupid little feature adding a document library to the system, we only recently added sections and subsections, the ability to reorder them, the ability to search. It was only recently added because the customer finally decided, oh, and, and static URLs, because now they can put these library documents in their other system that when you select different pumps and compressors and blowers, they can now reference statically the documents that they're now putting. I'm actually thinking of pulling it out as a separate component, because right now it's inside the code base for this yeah, I just threw it in there. But it's really standalone. It's got its own admin module. It's got its own all kinds of stuff. Oh, can we get user, can we get counts of usage? Because we might change the order of our, oh. So none of that, I mean, I could have thought all that ahead of time. And some of the stuff is real obvious if you think about it. But I didn't build a single thing other than I'm going to put documents out there. And then I'm going to track, does anybody use it? And these, these guys use the crap out of it. And they want more. Cool. Now that I've validated that's a valuable feature, 
I'll build more. So that's another important thing. Ever be blocked by something? You're trying to code something and you're blocked? Well, my goal is never to be blocked. And in all kinds of weird ways, you know, like even we have a system that's got a lot of legacy stuff and, and other systems that rely on it and weird, you know, the other group generates this strange XSL stuff. And there was some in, you know, interaction where it comes from the app that we're building, it, you know, there's a little flag and they had some bug on their end, but he couldn't get our system running on his bot. I was like, look, you don't need our system. Just set the flag. I don't care if you change it in your code to set the flag. Don't be blocked. Don't be waiting for us. Don't be waiting. You know, always find a way to get around being blocked, at least temporarily. But in my mind, no excuses. You got to get stuff out the door. I don't do planning unless I have to. I don't do estimation. I do planning. I have a complete roadmap with outcomes that I could show you and actual measurements of the outcomes of actual usage. But I don't estimate unless I have to. I no longer even do the sprint planning. I don't do any of that crap anymore. Because I, long ago, I kind of turned the sprint into just a bucket. It's another bucket. I'll even, I'll even bastardize versions. It's just another big bucket. I use it more for staging if I'm interested in kind of big chunks of how I'm thinking the product needs to be built. So Scrum's not agile, and I don't do all the ceremony, because if it's not paying back, why do it? If you're not getting anything out of it, why should I bother estimating it? Why should I care if I can get 10 things done or 15 things done? Don't care. I just better be doing the right things. Because whether I'm accurate at estimating, like if you, if you force me, I, and I would tell this to, to the business people I work with, if you want me to be accurate about that, I'll be accurate. What's it going to cost you? It'll cost you something. Like if, if you're going to make us care about that stupid line, that's going to cost you. And, and it won't be more features for less money. It'll just be some stupid, crazy techniques that will probably cause bad behavior. So, you ever see those burn down charts? These are some of the better ones. Some of ours are really hilarious. And we laugh. Like, like one time the, the business said, you know, you're doing monthly sprints. Can, you know, I, I was talking to a friend of mine over in the, uh, on the West Coast. Can, can you do weekly sprints? Sure. Don't care. <laughs> right? I mean, because I, don't, I, I didn't actually do sprints in the first place. So I turned them to weekly sprints. And they didn't look any better. They're just shorter. Um, but, but it's, you know, it, it would be hilarious. Every, every Monday morning, you know, we'd, we'd uh, do the little ceremony. And, uh, of course, you know, what do you do with the ones that are left over? Oh, go into the next sprint. Of course, because it's just a prioritized list. Don't care. So. I, and oftentimes, they should put something in, the, in our little meeting, our little team room, that, that triggers on me saying, the scrum gods will strike me down. Because I do things that are, that are not proper. But I will say, we had a deadline. Can you get XYZ feature done for a trade show that the pump manufacturer industry is having? Now you got my attention, because once I commit, oh boy. Uh, you know, I just committed that on a December 9th, can you make a January 21st trade show date with Christmas and holidays in between? Lucky it's not Russia, because back then, the Russian developers had it made. They did, they, they, I don't know if you guys do this here, but it's wonderful if you've got the Julian and the Gregorian calendar, you take advantage of both. Hey, look at that, there's double Christmases. <laughs> Who knew? It's awesome. So I always, I always enjoyed it there. But in, in my mind, that led me to do very explicit estimating and being really stingy with anything that got on the stack. Until we built the bare minimum that was needed, it was for registering their users, they weren't going to announce it, get all new people onto their new system, yada, 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 so it had to work. And I, and I made sure we were done a week ahead of time, and we were. And then we could take our time, we could test some more, we could you know, maybe add a little bit, but in my mind, you estimate only when you have to. And I like to think software is just a to-do list. So. I've always treated it that way. It's like a list of things you want done. Don't make it any harder. 
I like safe, I don't know. Safe is cool, because I love their diagrams. I wish I, wish I had graphical artists, my slides would look better. Um, but, you know, you can have a fancy to-do list like that, which is, that was real work. I didn't make it up. Um, now that's bigger than my Kanban board today. That's got a lot more, <laughs> a lot more gates. People, I routinely stick up for JIRA. I've been using JIRA since it was probably a dot release, I think. And I've never really understood why people complain about it until I was at some group where a developer said something like, totally counter to how JIRA quote unquote works. Until I sat, this was during a stand-up, plus they were gaming the system, I called them out on it. But I went to sit pair with them. I said, well yeah, you just drag the thing over and you, know, you start it. So you dragged it, you know, wouldn't let them drag it. I'm like, so I realized that there was something weird going on. I went into the Agile, what was the name of the group? It was a group that was in charge of Agile, transforming the company and bringing Agile. So I went into the room, uh, oh man, whoever the heck set up Jira is like an idiot. Like, I can't believe that, you know, it's unusable. And then some guy piped up, ooh, that was me. I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> well, let me explain in a more nice manner. But yeah, so you can totally screw it up. It's a tool. If you have no idea what you're doing, you maybe you shouldn't be using a tool. Just like you could give me all the tools that my father had for building musical instruments, pretty sure my skill's not there with the same set of tools. So I just use, and the, it's hard to see in the screen, but I use Jira in a really simple manner. It's, it's a... It's a sticky note to-do list that can be viewed, hey, from Greece, how about that, right? Because um, I used to do it on the wall until people said, hey, you know, when I'm traveling, I'd like to be able to see that. Oh, okay. I was waiting for someone to ask for that feature. Tell you what, we'll put it in Jira. How's that? So to me, people that bitch about Jira might not understand Agile. I don't know. Or ask me. I'll show you how to use it simply. Um, I'm sure in my overtime, is anybody keep, what's that? Five more minutes. Five more minutes, thank you. And this is critical. Um, who here has stopped learning? <laughs> stopped learning, yeah, what? <laughs> that, that sentence couldn't have possibly been uttered. Yeah, our world, especially in software, is pretty darn dynamic, which is good and bad. Like you wish you could kind of maybe rest and do something the same for a while. But the practices that will serve you is understanding the core concepts about modeling. Understanding you might not be able to use all the same tools. I went to a, a .NET uh, project for six months. That Kanban board, that was sticky. That was .NET. And all I did was find all the cool things that I used everywhere else, just I would Google them. What's the .NET version of Cucumber? <laughs> right? I, you know, uh, and they, did thing, they did things like, um, one day I showed up, you know, we were starting and just building one feature at a time. I showed up and all of a sudden in, in, the, in the feature test was, and when recipe, you know, number 47 is pulled, I'm like, what's that? Oh, well, we preloaded the database with some fixed data. Well, that's what they'd always done, but that made me, like, fall out of my chair. Like, what? No, that's, no. Okay, we're going to throw that out. Sorry. Wish you'd asked me. Because we're going to do better ways with some tools. So I said, all right, let's research how to do like, you know, factory, like factory girl or something like that. How to build data on the fly was part of your test. So there's all kinds of awesome things you can do. And a lot of it, you just might need to find the tools that work in your environment or create some or mimic them. So I think that's, that's something that's amazing today is you still have to keep up with all those practices. I personally, why isn't it showing up? Come on. That's odd. It's not showing the same screen. Well, anyway, so another topic that I had was parallel development. I've strived for decades to do single piece flow, which is like a lean concept. And admit software is, is not quite the same as manufacturing. Uh, I've been borrowing a lot from my son who's in discrete manufacturing and medical device and doing actual, you know, machining. But single piece flow is how I try to drive everything we do. And sometimes we achieve it. Like, I think I, I just deployed some language translations this morning from here that I did a pull request from Phrase app 
because my Chinese and, and Italian colleagues just finished something, and they were they've been bugging me since last week. And I said on Monday I would do it, and it's, now it's Thursday. Um, so I just did it this morning. Pull requests, got it through. The tests all still passed because sometimes a we try to put the actual translations into a test, but people still often write just the text. And if I change the wording of the translate, anyway, you understand. But that kind of thing was single piece flow. I was able to get it out the door, test passed. Yeah, I think I did it before, took a shower, breakfast, came back. Might have seen it here that all the tests passed. Deployed it to QA, and I just, before this, just before this meeting, I sent the message on Slack, hey guys, test your Italian and Chinese. So it's, we can do single piece flow, kind of, sort of, but it's hard to do it in the, in the big picture. So I'm not gonna say we're there yet, but that's always been an ideal. Uh, so we still do topic branches and pull requests, uh, and it still bothers me a little bit that it's a little heavy. It still feels like, like reducing the gap in time between the feedback might be pairing. So sometimes we mob, sometimes we pair, but often, still not often enough. And so even that, I think, is a challenge. So let me unplug this and try again, because I get your last slide. Oh, sure, it's just stuck on that one slide. What the heck? What, does the, does the thing have a memory? <laughs> okay, so. The, the bottom line is it's hard to be agile. In my mind, it's a lot like mountain climbing, rock climbing, yoga. It starts as a very personal practice. And it's a constant, you know, you're never a master in yoga. Anyone here do yoga? I'm always a student, never a master. You should see my forward bends, they suck. <laughs> but anything with upper body strength is good, like I can do a handstand, but yeah. So always a student, and it's the same thing in our A big field. round of applause for John. And before we move on to our coffee break, we'll take three questions. So shoot. And I'll be here all two days, so you can catch me. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, how you don't do planning? <laughs> how I don't do planning? Planning and estimation. I mean, it's, well, it's there. How you don't it's a little false to say I don't do planning, but. Um, Unless you need it. How about so, before you need it? So the kind, I do roadmap planning. So I do high level roadmap planning. Um, and you can see here that oh, it's hard to see. But there's, on the left is a version number. In the middle is what it is we're trying to build. On the right, so when it starts, it's not green. These are all completed. And, and it starts with an outcome. If I build this, what, like that was the very first registration feature that I promised that we could get done, delivered in January. And what do I expect out of it? Well, I expect a bunch of people to be able to register. And so the little statistics that you see there were from the app you know, a month later. Saying, oh, look at that. Hey, how about that? It, it worked. So that's the kind of the high level planning is more strategic. And it's about you know, the roadmap and how I'm building things. And then I, I try to hold ourselves accountable to it. Anyone else? It's about the same topic. You said you estimate only when you have to. When you have to. So the question is, I, I estimate only when I have to, and when do I have to? Um, pretty much only if there's a true deadline. I don't like fake deadlines. So I've only ever, now my first half of my adult life was DOD contracting bid in proposals, stupid ideas of estimating the unknown. So you can see that I swung the pendulum all the way over to where I abhor. <laughs> Maybe I'm afraid to commit, but I, I don't like to have to estimate unless there's a real need. So it usually is a deadline, a real one. Like, don't make one up. Don't say, well, it's really important you get this feature out the door by such and such. Why? Because I said so. Like, give me a real reason, and then we can back into it. But otherwise, why should I care? So I will say another holistic bit. 
actual issues, I put what I consider a complexity level. Not, and I use story points, which is funny. So I like one, two, three. And I never do threes. If I, if I see myself put a three, I break it down. So one of the, one of the keys is no, I have no big issues. I might have epics with a lot of little issues, but I, I never put a giant thing through the pipeline. There's, only, you know, there's never that boa constrictor who just ate a goat. Right? There's always small little things. So the best I do is I put what I think the estimate is from a size complexity, and the developers know, because it was funny, one of the business people said, oh, do you, you know, what are those story points? And I turned to the team, please answer. <laughs> Got it right. Um, but the idea is that just helps us make sure we're on the right path, that if they think something is worse than it is, then we need to talk. But I never care, is that a t five or a 10? Is that a large, medium, or small t-shirt? I don't, because the only reason you need to do that is if you're trying to put, oh, what's your velocity? I like to drive fast, um, but I, I was told by the taxi driver, don't go over 140 here, because I said I'm getting a car. But, so th the only real reason to do those kinds of sizing is because you, you care about them and you're trying to, I don't know, do something else. I just want to know that the team is working on the right thing at the right time in the right order, and we're doing the best we can, and we have conversations about everyone to not make it too expensive, right? So it's, it's a real combination of things that keep it so that I don't have to estimate. And one more question. One more here at the back. Maria. Thanks for the presentation. My Iron question. Maiden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you weren't even born when I was listening to <laughs> Iron Maiden. Uh, if you go back to that meeting uh, at the Agile Manifesto signing, would you change something now? No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.